Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. reading from Numbers. People from Mount Hor, the Israelites, set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. I'm about to offend some people in the room, and it has nothing to do with Carolina and Duke basketball. <laughs> oh, oh, that offended you too, didn't it? So, no, no, no. I'm offending you today because I don't like the color rose. I do like pink. Pink's a fine color. But this, the fourth Sunday, sorry, pink's a great color. But as a liturgical color goes, it's not such a great one. This, the fourth Sunday of Lent, and the third Sunday of Advent is all are, are sort of lighten up days in our liturgical calendar. And in many churches, you will see rose vestments on this day, which are nice enough. But I think we can get the idea of refreshment without that little extra bit. And we pause on this, the fourth Sunday of Lent, uh, I forgot this is broadcast over the world. So for all of you friends of mine who wear rose vestments today, I love you as a person. <laughs> this, the fourth Sunday of Lent, we lighten up from our Lenten Disciplines Sunday, knowing this Sunday as Refreshment Sunday, we call it. And we pause to take a few deep breaths in the midst of all our disciplines that we've been imposing upon ourselves during this holy season. We pause, we gather strength, because we know we're going to need it to move through the end of Lent and through the passion of our Lord into Easter Day. The lesson from John today references the lesson for numbers the kind of matching up that doesn't always occur in the lectionary. And in Numbers, the people of God are on their sojourn in the wilderness with God, and after having been brought out of slavery, their life continues to be less than ideal. It's difficult. And I love it when the Israelites complain, because it reminds me of how human a story the Bible is a story of a real God with real people. Like, I love it when they're complaining about being hungry and they moan, oh, that we had stayed back in Egypt with the flesh pots because at least there we had something to eat. And the Lord bears with them in their complaining and instead of cutting them off, gives them manna from heaven about which we hear in the collect for today. The Lord provides refreshment. In the lesson today, they're complaining again. This time, the Lord 
sends serpents. And when the people realize the error of their ways, they repent. But instead of giving up on them, as you or I probably would do, and leaving them to fend for themselves, God instructs Moses to create a staff with a bronze serpent on it. And whoever gets bitten by one of the snakes is instructed then to look upon this staff and he or she will live. It's another refreshment of sorts. God, knowing that the people will continue to sin and to complain, has mercy on them anyway. Now, this serpent on a pole, you can see it on the cover of your bulletin. Everybody look real fast. And then I'm going to ask for your attention again. You see that that picture there? That serpent, that, that symbol, it might remind you of the medical profession. It too, that symbol, started off as a single serpent around a pole and then varied in design until we get to what we have today, two snakes intertwined around a single staff, sometimes surmounted by wings. This is the staff associated with a Greek god, Asclepius, uh, known for healing, and thus its connection with medicine. And yet it bears a remarkable similarity also to the symbol described in Numbers with Moses, also a staff associated with healing. The two symbols arose around the same time in the 13th century B.C. Rabbi Ari Vernon writes that the healing powers associated with the staff of Asclepius and the Israelite bronze serpent may imply a relationship between the two symbols. The ancient Greeks may have borrowed from the ancient Israelites or vice versa. We both may have appropriated from another local culture. Whatever its provenance, the staff of Asclepius and Moses' staff are both imperfect devices. Medicine heals, it does, but disease often remains and new ailments can pop up at any moment, as we all know too well. And Moses' staff, it also healed, but those pesky snakes remained. It didn't get rid of them. This moment of refreshment, this temporary respite from Lent, these reminders of healing are all there to strengthen us for the ultimate pain that comes on Good Friday. That is the day of the crucifixion, a day to remember another figure lifted up on a staff of sorts. This is, of course, the symbol where Christ is depicted as dying on the cross, a crucifix. And the crucifix gets a bad rap in our tradition. At the time of the Reformation, there was significant superstition associated with the crucifix in many parts of the church. I'll give you that. For some, at that time then, the Reformation, other symbols then took precedence. The empty cross, or the triumphant cross, with Christ risen hovering before the cross, or with Christ as king, there on the cross, bearing the wounds of the crucifixion, but dressed as a priest and wearing a crown. In some strains of Anglicanism, and thus Episcopal churches as we call them in this country, the crucifix virtually disappeared. Matter of fact, Henry VIII had them all smashed, any that he could find, as he was stealing the wealth of the monasteries for his own pocket. That's a whole other story. Yet a particular strain of Episcopalianism, of Anglicanism, has preserved this symbol throughout our existence. Even Elizabeth I herself, the great creator of the prayer book, still used the synthesizer of the prayer book, who's still in use in England today, had a crucifix in her private prayer chapel. So, sure, there was a time when the crucifix was perceived as hocus-pocus, Hocus pocus also, by the way, comes from the Latin mass, words that were misheard and construed with magic. That's a whole other story. But there was a time when the crucifix, yeah, it was, it was perceived as hocus pocus, 
But that's true of almost everything in our religion. And still, some people have a visceral reaction or even a revulsion, this shock and offense when they encounter a crucifix today. I'm here today to make the case for the crucifix. I believe that sometimes it is helpful to be reminded that Christ suffered, especially when we are suffering. When we're alone, when we're in pain, when we're facing another round of chemo, when the family that we love is breaking apart, the crucifix reminds us that God knows exactly how we feel. Pope Francis has said that if we want to know the love of God, we look at the crucifix. And no, I'm not swimming the Tiber anytime soon. That means becoming a Roman Catholic, you know, the river in, in Rome. I'm firmly planted in Canterbury. Our brother Francis, who calls us brothers and sisters, has a lot to teach us. If we want to know the love of God, we look at the crucifix. Despite the obvious cognitive dissonance involved in saying as much, the crucified Christ isn't just about suffering. Jesus himself says to John, If I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And I believe that when God in Christ says all people, God means all people. This symbol then of sacrifice is also a symbol of welcome. At the former College of Preachers at the Washington Cathedral, there sits this chapel with a remarkable piece of art at its heart. Behind the altar on the wall, there is a crucifix, but instead of seeing the face of Christ on that crucifix, one sees the back of another person. Because into those outstretched arms of the cross, another being, you and me that is, are being embraced by those outstretched arms of Christ. So unlike the imperfect symbols of the Greek and Mosaic staves with serpents, in the crucifix, we find a reminder of that healing that is offered that roots out sin and wipes it away forever. Paul writes, we preach Christ crucified. You see in, in churches all over the place, Episcopalian, in any kind, Roman Catholic, whatever, oftentimes right here behind the pulpit is a crucifix, if anybody wants to give one. Uh, A lovely spot there because the whole idea is we preach Christ crucified. It's right out of the scriptures. It's that reminder every time that we are preaching that that is central to our identity. Not because of some gory fixation with suffering or asphyxiation or bloodshed, but because that symbol means life. It's an odd enough thing that we have turned an instrument of death into, of institutional death even, into our main symbol. Because, you know, the cross was how everybody was killed by the Romans. There were often hundreds and thousands lining the roads. It wasn't specific to Jesus and those two criminals on that one day. It would be as if we all took electric chairs and wore them on chains around our neck. It's the same symbol. So that's pretty odd that we do that to begin with, right? Whether it's an empty cross or not. So I encourage you then, in light of how odd it is to begin with, to ponder all the kinds of crosses that there are out there. The empty ones, uh, the empty one, the small one that's there, there today, the bloodied ones, and the glorified ones. Each has a lesson to teach And we need all of those lessons together to have the fullest possible picture of the ineffable, unknowable work of Christ. 
And so as we move now into this second half of Lent, be mindful of the goal. Because we aim to Easter Day, sure enough, but we have to go through Good Friday to get there. We know that the empty cross awaits, but not before it stands full of suffering and in that redemption. Be comforted then by a God who knows exactly what you feel. You know, our friends go through troubled times all the time and we say, oh, I feel your pain. I've been there. I know what you're feeling. No, we don't. We can never be in another person's shoes, but God can and God has. God knows exactly what we have experienced and has experienced it with us. And that, my friends, is a source of comfort and of joy. We are in this with our God together. We affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the truth of your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. 
We pray especially for those on our parish prayer list, including Laurel, Charles, Shirley, Irwin, Ben, Mary, Donna, Frank, Jeremy, Harrison, Sarah, Mildred, Angela, Steve, Martha, Muriel, Liz and Alex, Joan, Courtney, Shirley, Sandra, Philip, Amanda, Nancy, Audrey, Ruby, Josh and family, Mia, Allison, Linda, Susan, Alicia, Sloan, Mandy, Brian, Susanna, Dean, Liz, Noel, Melody, Chris, Jenia, Betsy, Allie, Austin, George, and those whose names are offered at this time silently are allowed. that they may know the healing power of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, including Martha Lackey, Jack Neal, Benji Siegel, Mary McLean Armfield Sherrill, Billy Ragsdale, Fran Murphy, Hope Chapman, Henry May, Marion and Jim McNair, Helen Irwin, Mary Bryan Smith, Buddy Virgil, Pete Pulliam, and Bill Pong, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, Mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. to apologize to anybody who has on pink. It really isn't pink that's the problem. I love pink. It's just I don't want vestments made out of it. I got plenty of shirts and ties and all that other stuff. Welcome on this day. I am glad that you are here, and that we are worshiping together. I commend to your attention all of the announcements found there in your bulletin. Remember that all of our youth Christian formation activities continue today. Mother Palmer is away with Jenny Campbell and our youth confirmands. That's where she is today with that youth activity. Beloved Community Commission offers a, an adult forum series at 1015, what it means to be on sacred ground. There's a parenting class uh, that today is a family-friendly Stations of the Cross that begins out in the labyrinth at 1015. Our Faith and Grief group meets this week on the 14th. 
We are all encouraged to participate or to share the news to our friends and family, folks outside of the parish who may benefit from this really remarkable and holy time together, this faith and grief ministry. The next Women's Fellowship Dinner is March 18th, and the sign-up is open, and Easter memorials are due. So if you wish to make a contribution in memory or honor of someone for the music and flowers at Easter, those need to be in ASAP so that we can make sure the names that you would like included get included in the bulletin because that, that insert is complicated and gets made well before uh, Easter Day. I also was reminded recently that not everybody knows the Reverend Deacon Maggie Silton. Maggie, stand up for us. Maggie, you see her around sometimes, usually in the pew, in the very back row is her spot. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes you see her up here. She is a long-serving deacon in the Diocese of North Carolina, retired from Chapel Hill, lives a couple blocks away, uh, and she... Uh, worships here, and so she's our deacon associate. That means she is a deacon who worships here, because clergy are technically members of the diocese and not a parish, which is why we have to do all that funny stuff with names. She's our deacon associate, and so uh, she uh, gladly fills in when we need extra help. So Maggie, we're thankful. Everybody say hey to Maggie. We also need you to be caught up on the exciting work around the budget by your vestry. And so Joe Weatherly, our senior warden, is going to come forward to tell you about it. <laughs> Good morning. In the spirit of keeping things light and refreshing, we thought we'd talk about budget. Um, but... <laughs> And I think it's a coincidence the lesson was from numbers today. So anyway, here goes. Um, at our late February meeting, the vestry adopted a 2024 budget, and David and the vestry and I wanted to share some of the highlights with you. First, unlike the Weatherly household budget, it's balanced. Uh, we're only spending within our anticipated pledges and inflows. Um, next, it's, it's important to point out that our 2024 pledges are up 2% over last year. As a result, we were able to increase total spending by about $100,000 over last year's budget. Um, several important spending categories have been restored to pre-COVID levels, including giving outside the parish. We were able to give a small cost of living raises to staff and clergy. We put some money in the budget for part-time clergy for when Sarah goes out on a well-deserved sabbatical late this year. In addition to budgeting for routine repairs and maintenance, we're beginning to set aside some monies into a church keeping fund, which we can draw upon in the future for unexpected repairs. We hope to build upon this discipline in future, future budget cycles. Now, if you're wondering why we waited all the way to the end of February to pass the budget, you may recall that uh, as we approached year end 2024, our pledge levels were lagging a bit. So we delayed, it, delayed our normal timetable by a couple of months. But thanks to the efforts of Tom McCarty and Todd Class, who led our stewardship campaign, vestry members who jumped in to help, and of course the congregation, as I said, our ultimate 24 pledges have exceeded last year. But to help us get off to a quicker start for the next year's campaign, we put aside some monies in this year's budget to help assist in that effort. I also want to recognize the work of Joe Brower, our new treasurer, who drove our budget process this year, and thanks also to Will DeBose, our outgoing treasure, treasurer who's been gracious with his time as Joe and I get up to speed. Uh, Joe Brower, David, and I have already begun to think how we can improve the budget process for next year, uh, including seeking earlier involvement of staff, clergy, and of course the congregation. Now, right before I got up here, Mitzi Weatherly reminded me that you guys are operating on one hour less of sleep, so she said, keep it short. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that the budget process this year felt a tad bit easier maybe than it had been in recent years. As you may recall, we've been adjusting in past years sort of a spending levels to a post-COVID world. But uh, we believe that these are positive all developments that uh, I, I've mentioned today, and we just wanted to share it with you. So thank you.
we've come a long way from the hives I broke out into at my first budget cycle. Uh, and I kid you not, that's literal. <laughs> Uh, when we were cutting hundreds of thousands of dollars to celebrating the things we can add back. Friends, thank you for your generosity, for your patience throughout these three years of adjustment. Uh, it's exciting times. Uh, we turned a corner. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy, and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace, which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints 
into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Look down in mercy, Lord, on your people who kneel before you and grant that those whom you have nourished by your word and sacraments may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. <clears throat> 